Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers DUIs, body cameras, and obstruction, and is brought to us by the Civil Rights Lawyers Channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. Shortly after midnight on January 6, 2023, Deputy William Henderson of the Berkeley County Sheriff's Department responded to the scene of a single car accident in Berkeley County, West Virginia, in which 22-year-old Carrie Harmon, the daughter of Berkeley County Sheriff Nathan Harmon was driving. The accident investigation was recorded on Deputy Henderson's body camera. Impressive. Oh my. Good, how y'all doing? Yeah, she was a driver. He was in the pickup truck. It's all the same. Not hurt or anything? No, I'm good. Okay. You need your license, right, state insurance? Gotcha. I'm good, it's all. You're good, we're good, man. Yep. How y'all relate to each other? We're just friends. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm actually driving that truck right there. I smell a lot of dog poop or something. I know, it, well, it don't surprise me. <laughs> yeah. I say, I think I stepped, yep. I think I did step on it. I felt a lot of mud on my Yep, I just, I don't know if it's mine or... You have a preference on a tow truck, ma'am? No, I'm going to let my dad take care of it. My dad will take care of it. My dad's Nathan Harmon. He's on his way right now. Okay. You want to give a statement about what happened? Yes, sir. If you just felt the top, you can send your car Let me call you too. back. I gotta give the police a statement real quick. Just don't forget to sign down the bond when you're okay. done. Can you see all right? I can see. Went for a little ride, huh? I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Since my dad pulls up, I already know he's gonna give me. <laughs> I'm gonna be on my about it. <laughs> I didn't see it. I mean, it's either swerve or hit something else or it's just hit the right on. What, a deer? Yeah. You always hit it. Right there on my right hand side. I ain't gonna lie. My leg and my shoulder is kind of. Dead. Just watch. You need medics? No. Hell sure? no, I ain't no. Well, it's okay. <laughs> Just watch the dog poop. Yeah, right? That's all I'm worried about. You want this back, sir? I'm hey, if you can just hold on to it for a minute, right. I appreciate it. Ms. Harmon claims that she was hit by a deer on the passenger side of her vehicle. And in the police accident report, which was obtained by the civil rights lawyer and can be found in the blog post linked in the description below, Ms. Harmon wrote that she was following, and I'm quoting, her man home when she was hit by a deer on her right passenger side. However, it should be noted that Deputy Henderson concluded in his report that no evidence of a deer strike was observed, and instead described the car accident as follows. Quote, Vehicle number one was traveling north on Cemetery Road and failed to negotiate a curve to the right. The vehicle ran off the roadway to the left, striking a mailbox shrub with a concrete block, which caused the passenger side of the vehicle to come off the ground. The vehicle struck the ground, along with striking three fence posts and approximately 14 feet of vinyl fence. Literally just got this motherfucker too. Yeah. Yo, he's going to be pissed. Yeah, well, he's on his way. I already know. I called him. I said, Dad, <laughs> you hit me and um, literally my, my car's done. And the crazy thing is, me and my man, we're literally, we live right across from these rocks right here. Oh, really? Yeah. You said the deer actually hit you? Yes. He should have hit me. I'm telling you. For it to look like that, it's got to hit me. Mm -hmm. I saw that motherfucker on the right-hand side, and I'm like, oh, no. It's either swerve or you hit it. Oh, yeah. man. I know. You don't watch stuff because you got open shoes on. Uh, can you sign that down the bottom for me? What's that? I just need to sign it. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I can just put a date on there. Oh, I got you. There you go, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. Morning. You have a preference in tow truck, sir? Lessons. Lessons? I got an item on her car that I need to check. Okay. You got flash on it? <laughs> Have you talked to him? Uh -huh. Is he drinking? Oh, I can't tell. Sheriff Harmon asks Deputy Henderson if his daughter has been drinking, and Deputy Henderson chuckles and states that he, and I'm quoting, can't tell. Although it seems that Deputy Henderson was implying that Ms. Harmon had been drinking, or at the very least that she might have been, in the accident report, he indicated that Ms. Harmon's condition at the time of the crash was quote-unquote apparently normal, and that alcohol use was not suspected. After the incident, Sheriff Harmon told a reporter that field sobriety and breathalyzer testing were not conducted because Deputy Harmon did not 
suspect impairment, arguing that, quote, we have to have probable cause to move forward on anything, and that, now quoting again, you don't go up and stick a tube in someone's mouth just because, you have to have reasonable suspicion. According to Section 17C-5-2 of the West Virginia Code, quote, any person who drives a vehicle on any public highway or private road in this state while he or she is in an impaired state is guilty of a misdemeanor. The statute defines the term impaired state as a person who is under the influence of alcohol or who, now quoting, has an alcohol concentration in his or her blood of eight hundredths of one percent or more by weight. Under 17C-5-4 of the West Virginia Code, quote, a preliminary breath analysis may be administered whenever a law enforcement officer has reasonable cause to believe a person has committed an offense prohibited by Section 17C-5-2 of this code. Therefore, Sheriff Harmon is correct in his assertion that reasonable suspicion is required for an officer to require an individual to submit to a breathalyzer test. However, it is likely that a court would conclude that Deputy Henderson had at least reasonable suspicion if not probable cause, to believe that Ms. Harmon was driving under the influence, as courts have found single-vehicle accidents without an evident explanation to be significant evidence that the driver may have been impaired. In the 2020 case of United States v. Blakeney, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, which has jurisdiction over West Virginia, found that probable cause to issue a warrant for impaired driving existed based on, quote, the severity of the driver error that occurred in an accident where the driver lost control of his vehicle while navigating a gradually curving portion of the road and eventually crossed the median, along with the odor of alcohol coming from the vehicle and the driver's conduct at the scene of the accident. In reaching this conclusion, the court rejected the defendant's contention that the car accident could have happened for another reason, such as mechanical failure, determining that this argument, quote, misapprehends the probable cause standard, which requires only the kind of fair probability on which reasonable and prudent people, not legal technicians, and does not require an affiant to rule out all innocent and explanations for suspicious facts. Similarly, in the 2012 case of Wickland v. Commissioner of Public Safety, the Minnesota Court of Appeals noted that, quote, the combination of the odor of alcohol and a serious single car accident unrelated to weather or any other apparent cause has been held to indicate probable cause for a DWI arrest. Although Deputy Henderson did not mention an odor of alcohol, it is certainly possible that he noticed one, given his coy response to Sheriff Harmon's question about whether his daughter had been drinking, and it seems probable that the unexplained nature of Ms. Harmon's accident and her slurred speech alone would be sufficient to at least provide reasonable suspicion that she had been drinking, warranting a preliminary breath test, despite her allegation that the car crash had been caused by a deer. <laughs> <Right by you. laughs> oh, man! God damn it. Just be careful walk down there. There's almost dog poop in the yard. I think she rolled that thing. Because when you go up there in that yard, you'll see the tracks just completely stop. Because they stop right there. Yeah, she's turning to the right right here. Mm -hmm. Oh, you got to dig right here. Front right tire. Dig. Where's the other tire? Right there's right tire. She's on top of this. In fact, there's a freaking thing over there. So she's over top of the road, man. Got pretty lucky. Car yeah. might just—I think when she hit center block, the, the front end came up. She's on one tire right here, huh? Because there's a center block back there where the mailbox almost was on the other side of the bush. Yeah, yeah she's on one tire. Yeah. Oh, you're fine. I'm pretty much done. All I gotta do is just leave a note for them, so I don't get in trouble by state law. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let me uh, see. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about something. After stating that he is, and I'm quoting, curious about something, Sheriff Harmon seems to motion to Deputy Henderson, and Deputy Henderson turns off his body camera for the remainder of the encounter. Now, while some states have passed legislation requiring police officers to record citizen encounters with body-worn cameras, as of the date of writing this episode, West Virginia has not enacted any such mandates. Although it is reported that the Berkeley County Sheriff's Department purchased and equipped body cameras in 2019, the department has not made its body-worn camera policies public 
publicly available. However, in general, body camera policies typically only authorize officers to terminate recording in limited circumstances. For instance, the model body-worn camera policy for police created by the Prosecutor's Center for Excellence and the California District Attorneys Association states that every officer shall make every reasonable effort to activate the BWC prior to making contact in, now quoting, any enforcement-oriented or investigative encounters to confirm or dispel a suspicion that the person may be involved in criminal activity, and that, now quoting again, once activated, the recording should not be intentionally terminated until the conclusion of the encounter, unless tactical, safety, or practical reasons dictate otherwise. Similarly, the Vermont Criminal Justice Council's model body-worn camera policy requires that, quote, both the video and audio recording functions of the body camera shall be activated at the beginning of any investigative or enforcement encounter between an officer and a member of the public, and that, with limited exceptions, quote, body cameras shall not be deactivated until the encounter has fully concluded and the officer leaves the scene or continued custody of a person has ended. Nonetheless, the policy notes that, quote, there are specific situations in which the use of BWCs is not appropriate and officers should not initiate a recording, or if an audiovisual recording has been initiated, the officer may pause or stop the recording prior to the conclusion of the event. Under the policy, acceptable reasons for discontinuing recording or activating the mute feature include, quote, on-scene conferences between officers, supervisors, advocates, clinicians, EMS personnel, attorneys, prosecutors, or other situations in which the officer determines the conference would violate confidentiality, privacy, or individual rights. And, now quoting again, conferences between officers and supervisors that might compromise this or further investigations or would otherwise impede law enforcement efforts or strategy. The Texas Commission on Law Enforcement Sample Model Policy on Body-Worn Cameras also includes a similar exception stating that, quote, officers may stop recording an event where its use may compromise police operations. Examples include, but are not limited to, conversations with criminal informants, private conversations between officers or supervisory personnel, working traffic control, performing crime scene duties, or a situation where the officer would be placing in a tactical disadvantage. Because we do not have access to the department's body camera policies, and we do not know what the officers discussed after Deputy Henderson deactivated his body camera, it is impossible to say whether the deactivation violated policy. However, it seems unlikely that the footage would have compromised police operations or posed a confidentiality issue. And even if it did not violate policy, at the very least, Sheriff Harmon's apparent signaling to Deputy Henderson to deactivate his camera is highly suspicious. Because Deputy Henderson never resumed recording on his body camera, it is unclear what exactly occurred for the remaining duration of the investigation. However, according to the accident report, Ms. Harmon was issued a warning for failure to drive with due care and released. After the incident, a screen recording of Snapchat posts that Ms. Harmon was alleged to have filmed during the accident was shared. I done did it, y'all. I done did it. Well, ah, I love my dad. I'ma just say that. I love my god dad. When asked about this video, Sheriff Harmon claimed that the video was from two years ago, not the night of the accident, and Ms. Harmon stated in a social media post that, quote, The video of me driving off thanking my father was me being arrogant and attempting to sound gracious for getting out of a speeding ticket. A screenshot of a purported Snapchat exchange between Ms. Harmon and another individual was also shared on social media. In the conversation, the other individual asked Ms. Harmon if she was getting a DUI, to which Ms. Harmon responded, quote, I got a warning because Dad showed up. The other individual then and asserted that Ms. Harmon blew a quote-unquote 1.6, and Ms. Harmon defended her father's actions, stating that, quote, if your dad was sheriff, he wouldn't send you out either. However, in an interview with the Panhandle News Network, which is linked in the description below, Sheriff Harmon argued that the conversation had been altered and denied that his daughter had been given a breathalyzer at the scene. After public outcry over the incident intensified, Berkeley County Prosecutor Katie Wilkes Delegati requested that a special prosecutor be appointed, quote, out of an abundance of caution and to ensure transparency, and Morgan County Prosecutor Dan James was appointed to investigate Sheriff Harmon's actions following his daughter's car accident. On October 17, 2023, Sheriff Harmon was indicted by a grand jury on two counts of obstructing a law enforcement officer and two counts of providing false information to a state trooper. The indictment alleges that Sheriff Harmon interfered with Deputy Henderson's investigation into the crash, deleted and or concealed the GPS tracking data from the vehicle Ms. Harmon was driving, and provided false
false information to West Virginia State Police First Sergeant W.M. Roden by claiming that a preliminary breath test was not administered after the accident and that he did not delete the GPS data from the vehicle his daughter was driving. Following the indictment, Sheriff Harmon issued a statement that read, quote, As troublesome as these charges are for me to understand, I have faith in the justice system and that the jury will see the events of that night as I did. I was a concerned father, taking care of my daughter and my vehicle. I fully trusted the deputy to conduct his investigation at his discretion and ability without hindrance. Sheriff Harmon's statement also maintained that he would continue to serve the people of Berkeley County, writing that, quote, I can assure you this will not deter my dedication, passion for the job while putting our citizens' safety first. The statement concluded with a reference to Hebrews 11.1 1, and an encouragement to quote-unquote keep the faith. As of the date of writing this episode, the charges against Sheriff Harmon are still pending, and the Berkeley County Sheriff's Department's website continues to list him as the current acting sheriff. Overall, Sheriff Harmon and Deputy Henderson get an F for failing to investigate Ms. Harmon's suspicious and dangerous behavior, limiting their accountability and transparency by deactivating Deputy Henderson's body camera, and potentially conspiring to cover up evidence of Ms. Harmon's intoxication. Although Sheriff Harmon is innocent until proven guilty, the allegations in the grand jury indictment are reprehensible. And as indictments must be issued based on probable cause, there must at least be some evidence that Sheriff Harmon hid the results of Ms. Harmon's breathalyzer and deleted GPS data from the vehicle. And the fact that Sheriff Harmon appeared to signal to Deputy Henderson to deactivate his body camera makes me much more inclined to believe the allegations in the indictment. And while Deputy Henderson was clearly acting under Sheriff Harmon's authority, throughout the encounter, he seemed more concerned with avoiding dog poop rather than taking action to protect citizens from Ms. Harmon's hazardous driving. Even if Ms. Harmon had not been drinking, it is difficult to believe that any other citizen in this situation would not have been subjected to a breathalyzer test, or at the very least, questioned about whether they had been drinking. And this interaction reveals a dangerous double standard that seems to be in place within the department. Ms. Harmon also gets an F for either driving while intoxicated or driving recklessly, failing to take accountability for her actions, and apparently allowing her father to abuse his position to keep her out of legal trouble. Now, while we do not yet know all the facts in this case, Ms. Harmon's slurred speech, the level of driver error involved in her accident, and Deputy Henderson's response when Sheriff Harmon asked him whether his daughter had been drinking strongly suggest that she was intoxicated. Furthermore, even if the Snapchat post of Ms. Harmon thanking her dad was her actually reacting to getting out of the speeding ticket, as she claimed, it still demonstrates a willingness to take advantage of her father's position for her own benefit, and to solicit or accept preferential treatment. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic that you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even more police interaction content.